Hey everybody, uh, thanks for joining me. Start my presentation here. Uh, yeah, thanks for thanks everybody for coming to check out my talk. So uh, I don't know if anyone was here a couple of years ago. I did a I did kind of a quick intro to some machine learning stuff, and I remember when I was putting that talk together, thinking, you know, it's really hard to make this interesting. I shouldn't do another machine learning talk, uh, but here we are. So I'm going to throw some cat pictures in to keep things interesting. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ryan Stout. Uh, I'm a software developer here uh, in Bozeman. I do a lot of, uh, for a while I was doing a lot of web stuff. Now lately I've done uh, several kind of mobile slash hardware projects, uh, usually with some machine learning aspect to it. And then uh, right now I'm in the middle of a Kickstarter campaign that it looks like I'm going to be working on for a while. So. Um, so real quick, uh, the, the, intro, the, the title of the talk is A Shallow Dive into Deep Learning. And for those of you who aren't familiar, deep learning is a type of machine learning. And, and what we're trying to do in machine learning, you know, I'm a software developer, but the challenge, the challenge being a software developer is there's a lot of problems that we actually can't solve. Uh, there's a lot of problems that we want to use computers for, but we actually can't go about and just manually write an algorithm to solve some of these problems. So machine learning is really all about teaching our machines um, to solve problems in juxtaposition to directly programming them. So there's a set of algorithms that, that you can use and they basically learn from example. So you're able to create what's called a training set and nowadays that typically involves you know, millions, thousands or millions of photos and, or uh, thousands or millions of examples, and from that, it's able to learn something. Um, in day to day, what that ends up looking like is you're creating what's called a training set, and then you're passing that to one of these machine learning algorithms, and they're creating what's called a model. And once you have that model, you can, you can give it new examples of data that it's never seen before, and it, you know, if it works, it'll create a prediction you know, tell you what tell you what it's looking at, tell you what you should do, things like that. So, there's this hierarchy in machine learning. Machine learning is a big set of algorithms, and specifically today, I want to talk about neural networks. And within neural networks, you've probably heard the term deep learning. Typically, that's referring to a deep neural network. For years, neural networks uh, neural networks have been around since the 50s, I believe, and they kind of have come and gone in popularity, but what's really brought them back to the forefront is this ability to train deeper and deeper networks. For a long time, we, there were just all these problems with training large networks. So you could use neural networks to solve simple problems, but it was hard to you know, teach it to drive a car or something like that. And as you guys probably know, in the last couple of years, those are, those are things that we've actually been able to do, and by we, I mean other people. Um, so today I want to talk specifically about computer vision because that's kind of what I've been working in a lot. You'll see computer vision used for lots of different things. It's sort of any time where you're taking in visual data. So this is video or photos. Um, there's even sort of you know lidar things like that are all treated sort of in the visual in the visual realm. Um, so it's used for things like self-driving cars, quality control. You'll see it actually in agriculture a lot. You know there's Apple's coming down the line and they're figuring out which ones look good, we can sell the customer, which one has a worm in it and it'll get made into applesauce, things like that. Uh, there's object detection, so this is when you upload your photos to Google Photos and it tells you, you know, there's a person and there's a car and there's a tree, when it's labeling what's in the photo. Uh, and then handwriting recognition is kind of another example that's been around for a really long time. The challenge that computer vision has had for years and years and years is what's called invariance. So if, you're, if I'm trying to develop a computer vision algorithm, say I want to detect uh, whether someone's, dr someone's drawing a character, and I want to know is that an X or an O, I could create an algorithm just, that just says, does this match these pixels, right? Um, and on the rare occasion that they draw perfectly, you know, I could say, yes, that's an X. The problem is, as humans, we're able to kind of consider a whole bunch of different things to be, uh, to be an X or an O. So you have this problem of, is this an X, you know, if we shift the position within the image? 
what about if you scale it? Or um, rotate it, you know, objects that are in 3D, we can see them from different angles. Uh, the orientation can be different. And then lighting is another big thing where if, we show, if we're showing examples and all the lighting's the same, how do we teach it to actually recognize objects when, when it's in a different environment, when the background's different, things like that. So all of these kind of fall into the category of invariance, and it's kind of the core challenge of, machine, of uh, computer vision is actually creating algorithms that hold up uh, and are able to recognize things in situations that they've never seen before. And right now, the kind of the best way to do computer vision is with a neural network. So as I'm gonna kind of walk through an example here and kind of try to explain how, how some of that invariance is achieved and what, it actually, uh, what actually goes on in one of the popular uh, computer vision algorithms. So let's, let's do a quick example that's gonna have, uh, that's gonna work from handwriting recognition. So if people are drawing characters, we're gonna be taking a 14 by 14 pixel grid. That's gonna be the input to our network. And then we're gonna tr be trying to predict whether it's they're drawing an X or an O. And one of the things to keep in mind is you're gonna create this training data that has, you know, 100,000 examples of X's, and we say these are X's, and then 100,000 examples of O's, and we say these are, o these are O's. And then the algorithm's gonna learn from that. Then when we show it a new picture where we don't have the label, it's gonna be able to tell us one way or the other, hopefully. Uh, I promise cat pictures to keep things interesting. There you go. All right, I did that because we're gonna dive in here. Uh, so this, this is an example of what a neural network might look like. If you've never seen one before, it, it looks more complicated than it is. Basically on the left side here, if we're using this for computer vision, this network would allow us to do uh, a five, take a five pixel image, which you, know, you can imagine this scaled up. But So if you see on the left, there's X1 through X5. What we would do is we'd take our image, we'd put the values of the pixels in each of X1 through X5. So let's just, for example, say we're, doing, we're dealing with a purely black and white image, you know, and, uh, a white character would be a one and a black character would be a, or white, pixel would be a one and a black pixel would be a zero. And then the arrows that go across, those are called connections. And what, what happens is we start on the left and we propagate the pixels to the right. And what we do is each of those connections has what's called a weight on it. And so the weights are how the algorithm learns. I'm gonna hand wave this for a second and I'll come back to it, but there's, this, there's an algorithm we can use to change the weights so that we get the predictions we want. So if we start with x1, say there's a one in there, there might be a weight of 0.5, we'll go across the top line, multiply it by, you, you multiply at each of the weights, and then you sum at each of the h1 through h4. So you, so you add together all the inputs. And then we repeat that process, we go to the next layer and to the next layer. And this h1 and i1, everything between the input and the output is what's called hidden layer. And what deep learning allows us to do is add more of those hidden layers so that we can, we can learn these more complex functions. Um, sort of a technical detail, but uh, we'll come back to this. At, at each of the hidden layers, after we sum the values, we apply, there's some different functions we can apply basically just to just keep the, keep the numbers within a certain bounds. So we don't want, um, in this case, we don't want the numbers to go really big negative. So we'll, we'll combine it with max zero and that'll make sure that it always stays above zero. Uh, so here's what that function looks like graphed. Uh, interestingly, sort of as a side note, uh, the, things we, the things that used to be popular to do in the past, there was sigmoid and some of these other functions, uh, ended up working worse than something this simple. So it's, it's interesting to watch the machine learning space because we keep doing these complicated things and then someone will actually go and, you know, Try, try something stupidly simple and it'll perform better. <laughs> uh, so it's been an interesting space to watch because there's been se several of those, hey, why did we think this was working when it wasn't? And so it takes a while to kind of, uh, for people to really learn what works in these complex situations. So anyway, so going back to computer vision, uh, if you train a network like this, let's say we had our 14 by 14 grid and just each pixel went into one of the inputs, 
and we made this a much larger network, uh, then this will work to an extent uh, to tell you, you know, whether you're seeing an X or an O. But there's a couple problems. So the, the big one is, uh, if you imagine this scaled up, there are just too many weights. It ends up being too computationally heavy, um, and, and we don't, uh, the training time just goes exponential, and we, we can never actually train some of these algorithms. The other big issue is this doesn't capture locality. So if you think about the pixels uh, fed into that last network, there's no relationship between a pixel that's near each other in space and one that's not. We could completely reorder the pixels and we would still get the same results as long as we did it the same way every time. And so one of the advances in computer vision has been figuring out ways to capture the relationship that pixels near each other are important related to each other. And so we'll talk about that in a minute and how we actually go about um, capturing some of that locality. The other big thing is it's not invariant. So if I was to train, uh, say I had a ton of examples where the X is in the middle, um, the only way I could get it to recognize an X that's in the corner is by having training examples where it's in the corner. So we need something that, uh, that does a better job of minimizing the weights, uh, capturing the locality, and, and handling some invariance. So this, the solution, that has, is really popular, has been really popular since um, in the last few years, is what's called a convolutional neural network. You'll hear these called con convnets or CNNs. Um, and these have really been a pretty big breakthrough. The first, uh, the first convolutional neural network came out in 98, but at the time we really couldn't train deeper networks, so it didn't, it didn't end up getting that much attention. And then once some of these deep learning breakthroughs came, people went back and said, oh, this is actually a great way to, to handle some of these problems. So I want to I give a little example to kind of show you how, how well these algorithms do, especially relative to what was possible a couple of years ago. There's a contest called ImageNet, uh, well, sorry, there's a data set called ImageNet that uh, contains 21,000 categories. These are based off of the WordNet project, if you've ever heard that. And in each category, there's 500 images, uh, or more in some cases. And they do a contest every year where teams compete uh, from across the world to try and classify uh, a thousand of these categories correctly. So what they'll do is they'll, have, they'll, they'll add some more uh, examples that aren't in the training data, and then they'll go and every team will compete and they'll run these, these extra training examples through and whoever can classify the most correct, they get five shots. Whoever can classify the most correct in their top five ends up winning. So here's, uh, you probably can't see this, but this is the, they're actually really small images, even today, like computer vision stuff works on pretty small images. So, so this is the soup category. <laughs> um, and they're broken into subcategories, but for the contest, they just kind of take the high level categories. So what, what's interesting here is looking at the error rate of different models that have won every year. So if we go back to 2010, uh, this was using a different technique other than neural networks and, and uh, convolutional neural networks, and the same with 2011. And then you can see in 2012, there's actually a huge drop uh, in error, which means a huge improvement in accuracy. And this was the first time that a deep convolutional neural network uh, was used. And what's interesting is, in machine learning, you almost never see a huge increase. Like, almost everything's somewhat incremental. And so when this happened, and it was, I think it was the only deep convolutional neural network that year, everyone took notice because it was, you know, it, it's pretty obvious when you have a drop like this that there's a significant breakthrough that happened. And so it's a really exciting time. And you can see um, it, the, the ImageNet contest hasn't been going too long, but historically it didn't, you know, didn't have any of the large drops like it did then. And from 2011 to 2014, we basically went from what is effectively terrible classification accuracy to human level accuracy in four years. Um, there is a little bit of an asterisk here because they, you know, when, every year they'll have humans try to classify the same images and they'll see how well they do. And so the big asterisk is 50 of the categories are typically dog species. <laughs> And so humans are not great at that, but the, uh, the algorithms are pretty good at it. And as a total side effect, 
Um, there's, there's like a couple apps in the app store that classify dog species for you, and they're unbelievable because, they're, because Google and Microsoft have put you know, thousands of man hours into trying to do better on this contest, and part of that is figuring out dog species. So, so if you have a dog species separating startup, the technology is already there for you. <laughs> So I want to dive into what actually makes convolutional networks work and just a little bit of, of uh, give you a kind of an idea of the process. I'm going to skip some of the math and skip um, some of the details, but I'll, I'll uh, happy to talk about that later. All right, before we dive in. All right. So if we go back to our slide of, of neural networks here, uh, you know, we kind of talked about the weights being a big problem and then locality and invariance. So what we'd really like is we'd like something that can detect what's called features. And features are basically parts of the image that relate to the whole. So here, for example, we're trying to figure out is this an X? And so what kind of what we want to learn is you know, an X has a center point, an X has, uh, you know, two diagonal lines, one going left to right, and one going right to left. So, what we do is we end up learning these, they're called filters. So here at the top, you can see there's three filters. We want to learn one for, one for each diagonal, and then one for the center point. And part of, I, I used the word convolution before, Part of convolution is taking these filters and applying them over every single spot in the image. And what we're trying to do is, as we move it over the image, we're trying to see if, see if that feature is in that location. And what this helps us do is actually decrease the size of the image that we're working with. We're kind of creating a new image that instead of, instead of showing the original pixels, it's telling us where the features are. So in this example, we're taking a 4x4 four four image and we're, we're convolving over it. Um, it's, this doesn't show the filter in the middle, but we're convolving over it with the filter and we'll produce a new image. So here I can show this a, a little better here. So our filter's in the top left, and then we would do this in every position, but right now we're at position 2-2. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to multiply the filter, the equivalent filter pixel with the location in the original image, and then we're going to put that into a new image. And then once we've done all of those pixels, we're going to average the value together. And what that gives us is a good indication of how well does this particular location in the original image match the filter. And I'll come back to how we actually learn these filters in a little bit. So once we have our original image, and we convolve over it, the, the X with the O around it is a uh, symbol for convolution. We end up with a new image that's typically smaller and doesn't represent original pixel values, it represents how well the features matched in each, in each pixel location. Uh, and I'm gonna stop, does anyone need any clarification on anything? Was all that fairly clear at that point? Uh, so once we've done one filter, we're going to do uh, a couple more, and as, as kind of the person who makes the network, we get to decide how many filters we need and, and how big they are and things like that. So, so we might do the other filter, and we'll pass it over every location in the original image and come up with, with another image. Here's kind of a good visualization of the convolution, convolutional layer. So you can see the filter in the middle, and we're creating the new image by um, moving that around and then we're getting one pixel sort of pixel value out in the new image. Here's kind of another example that shows, I mean effectively we're creating these filters and then they're they're mapping to something higher level and then we're using those. So so one of the interesting things is what makes this work is we're going to do a whole bunch of different filters and each of the filters is going to learn something different. So in this case, you know, we've done the center point, we've done the diagonals, and, and we end up, after the input, the next layer of the network has, in this case, three different filtered layers. 
So one of, one of the other things that we want to do is we want to continually shrink down the size of the data that we're working with. And every time we shrink, we want to be able to pull out, uh, pull out more data. It's almost like compression. We want to keep the things that are important and ignore the things that aren't. So, there's, so the next step is called max pooling, and there's only two steps, so just, just to give you a heads up. And what max pooling does is it takes a window, again, it takes a window that we slide over the image, but this time, instead of doing convolution, we're, or instead of, um, instead of summing the, multiplying by the filter pixels and, sum, and averaging, we're just taking the maximum value in each of these squares. So here, if we move to the next one, we're going to take the max. And what this does effectively is it, it's able to add some invariance to the network. So we no longer need the pixel, like the convolution, to be right around the center of the pixel. We're able to shrink the image down and say, OK, in this general area is a slanted line. In this general area is you know, whatever feature. And so again, we end up with another image. And all this gets put together. Um, gets put together into this larger network. So here, um, if you can see this, there's, we take our input and then we're gonna generate a whole bunch of intermediate features and then we do our max pooling to reduce the size and then we repeat that again and again and again. And nowadays networks may have literally hundreds of these filter layers, pooling layers, filter layer, pooling layer, filter layer, filter, filter pooling layer. And it just builds up higher and higher level, level representations of what we're actually working with. So once we get to the end, we're going to end up with, usually it's, a, usually it's each filter ends up being one by one. So we have a single pixel, so to speak, that represents what features were activated at that layer. So the final step is to add the fully connected neural network layers back so that we can, we can take those features and, you know, one of these features might be, it's an X that looks like this, or it's an X that looks like this. And we can connect those with weights that also get learned, and we can use the final values to predict whether, you know, whether it's an X or no, or, or on ImageNet there's a thousand categories, and it uses those to predict that. Um, the, one of the interesting things that's a little hard to visualize is that we actually start out, if we're doing a black and white image, we start out with a 2D uh, convolution, and then we actually end up creating these volumes of 2D images, but there's multiple of them, so they end up being treated as a 3D volume. So you can kind of see that um, on the, con the first convolution layer, there's three of them, and they're 2D pixels. And so what we end up doing past the first layer on a black and white image is we actually do 3D convolution. And so that lets you do some interesting things where a single filter can say, okay, an X has a center point in the middle layer, a diagonal in the first layer this way, and a diagonal in the other layer this way. And so you end up where, by doing this, it can pull features from different filters at the next layer and then combine those into one filter. All right, that was a lot of stuff. <laughs> so what's, what I think is fascinating is if we visualize the first layer of filters, these networks will typically learn edge detectors. So they'll, they'll learn, this is an example where each square is one of the, the weights on the filters uh, visualized. And what they'll end up learning is different edges at different angles, um, different sort of hardness, softnesses of edges, um, they end up learning kind of some wavy lines and, and other patterns. And then you see this was trained on color images. They end up learning a few color patches and gradients and things like that. And because of the way it's able to take the, do the 3D convolution layers, it's able to break things down into, okay, this, you know, a dog is these sets of colors, these sets of angles at the, at the beginning. And then it's able to, as we move up farther into the, into the convolutional layers, it's able to learn, start with edges, this was trained on faces, for example, and then it's able to learn these higher level features. So this, you know, learned noses and eyes and mouths and things like that. And then finally, at the end, we end up with these sort of generic faces that, you know, uh, at the final layer, before the fully connected uh, layer, you're gonna have 
a particular face is a mix of, in this example, you know, face one, face four, and face five. And so um, it's, really, it's really neat to see how it builds these up based on what you train it. And there's some evidence actually that, uh, from, from biologists, that the similar structures to this exist in, in the brain of animals. So we think we're on the right, uh, we think we're on the right track. And again, when I say we, I mean other people. So just one more, I want to do one more, show one more visualization here. Again, this is starting with a black and white image on the left. And if you see the arrows, the arrows point to the area in between where the uh, convolution or pooling function is happening. Then we end up with, you can see how there's these volumes of, filter, of filtered images. Uh, and then the nonlinearity is that uh, rectified linear unit that I talked about before. Not sure I actually mentioned that, but... Um, and then, you know, it keeps building up until at the very end we get the fully connected layer. So this is a simplified version of what most, uh, most computer vision uh, convolutional neural networks look like. And this one, for example, would be for predicting characters 0 to 9. Now I hand waved a little bit over how we actually go about setting the weights because this, that's really sort of the secret. Once we get, once we get the network um, set up the way we want it, it's able to make these predictions but only if the weights are correct. And the way we actually, um, the way we actually train uh, is through an algorithm called backpropagation. So if any of you have done neural network stuff before, this is kind of the standard, the standard way of figuring out um, how to change weights so that things get better. In this example, this is just a fully connected network, but you can see that if we made, if we took our training data and we made a prediction and say, say we took an X image and we, we said it's an 80% it's an chance that it's an X, um, we want that to be a 100% chance, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that 20% and we're gonna pass it backwards through the connections in the network and we're gonna adjust the weights so that they move in the direction of making it to closer to what we want. And, and we do that kind of by taking all of our training examples. We always take the training example, make a prediction, and then adjust the weights. Now the, the challenge with that is you know, we're moving a lot of variables at once. So how do we actually go about moving them correctly so that we're not you know, making things worse? And the way you can think about this is, uh, they call it error surfaces. And in this example, this is a two neuron input into a single output. So say we're trying to learn um, you know, the XOR function or something like that. We want to be able to, if we're trying to visualize this, we've got two weights. So over on the right, you can see it would make a grid, you know, an X and a Y grid. One of them could be X, one of them could be Y. And what we want to do is we want to, we want to change the weights so that the prediction is you know, as close to zero, as close to accurate as we can get it. And so what we do is we sort of, we see the direction we need to change in order to, uh, you know, we can, by back prop, through back propagation, we can, we can get what's called a gradient, which tells us which direction do we need to head, do we need, in which direction do we need to change these weights in order to make a better prediction. So we basically, this gradient descent algorithm starts with the weights at one point, changes them in the direction we need to go, and then we have to check again to see how accurate we are. And then we get a new gradient, and we move in that direction again. And we basically just repeat this process until things stop getting better. <laughs> um, so it's a little hard to visualize, but um, what you end up doing is uh, having it where each, each weight is sort of like a dimension uh, on, a, on a surface. So here, if we had three weights, we could, we could visualize a three-dimensional object where we're moving towards the lowest point. The challenge is, you know, you might have a million weights, and I can't visualize that. <laughs> uh, but it's easy to kind of, it's easier to think about in, in a, you know, two-dimensional, three-dimensional space. All right, everybody still with me? Okay, so what does this actually look like in practice? Because, uh, you know, I've, I've done quite a bit of machine learning stuff, and day-to-day, -day, 
you don't actually deal with a lot of this. Um, you deal more with creating the architectures of the network and creating training data and things like that. So now, um, when I started doing this uh, six or seven years ago, you were you kind of had to understand this and you had to be writing it all by hand. But now you can. There are some great tools out there that you can pick up and just start doing this. Uh, all you need to do is understand how to create a training set. Uh, and then there's sort of these pre-built, uh, pre-designed arc network architectures. You can just copy in the code and you know build a dog cat classifier in an afternoon. So uh, my personal favorite framework right now is Keras. Uh, pretty much all machine learning, not all of it, but the majority of it has has coalesced around Python. Uh, so if you know Python, it's a great way to get started. Uh, there are a few other, there are bindings for some of these frameworks in other languages, but uh, most of the ecosystem is in Python right now. PyTorch is another one that's kind of up and coming. The nice thing with PyTorch is it has really good pair, like multiple GPU implementations. Uh, and then Cafe is another one. So if you're interested, I would recommend checking out one of these three. I think they're, they're, all, they're all kind of higher level libraries that will let you focus more time on training and doing your architecture and things like that, and less time on actually figuring out if you correctly implemented backpropagation and things like that. Um, and one thing I do have to say is, uh, it's interesting because Google has kind of been pushing TensorFlow a lot, like you guys have probably heard of that. TensorFlow is actually not directly a machine learning library. It's what's called a graph computation library. So if you're gonna use TensorFlow for machine learning, you're gonna have to go and implement all this stuff yourself. Um, or there's some libraries, there's a lot of libraries built on top of it, but uh, when you Google for TensorFlow tutorial, you're probably gonna find something that's, here's how we implement the back propagation, here's, and that stuff's useful, but not if you're trying to get something done in a week or a month or something. Uh, and the main, thing, uh, the main thing you need, really, to do this is a GPU. So uh, almost all the tools right now are still built for NVIDIA GPUs. So I'd recommend, if you don't have one of those, you can boot up an Amazon instance that has an NVIDIA GPU and train on that. And if you're interested, there's some really good resources, uh, especially for the convolutional neural network stuff. Uh, I've heard good things about FastAI. I haven't actually used it, but I've heard good things. FastAI.com. And then years and years ago, I did the uh, Coursera Andrew Ning's machine learning class. Uh, and at least back then it was really good, and I think that content's still around, so. Um, anyway, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any, any um, and I'm happy to chat more if you guys want. So, uh, thanks, for, thanks for sticking around.